Well, that was a disappointment. And no, I don't mean Promise Neverland. I mean the fact that I recorded this video half an hour ago, but apparently the audio wasn't recording. So here we go again. But yes, the Promise Neverland was also quite a bit of a disappointment as well. Quite possibly the worst season two I have seen. Well, there was like Tokyo Ghoul Road A, which is also pretty terrible, but hey, it had cool music. And then again, Promise Neverland had a few good episodes at the start. So, you know, it's pretty close. Though, to be fair, I didn't care for Tokyo Ghoul Season 1 all that much, so it was less of a disappointment. So yeah, the thing that made this season so disappointing wasn't just that it was pretty bad, but it was that Season 1 was so great. Season 1 was one of my favorite anime ever, one of the best introductory seasons of any anime I've ever seen. It featured great suspense, mystery, mind games, character emotional impact, all those cool things I like seeing in anime. And Season 2 got off to a great start. Now this is the part of the video where I have to decide if I want to spoil things, and I'm going to because, well, the reason I don't spoil things is because I want you to have the experience of watching it for yourself, to experience all the great things about the story. But I don't want to experience this thing. Just listen to this review, hear my suffering, that will be enough for you. And yeah, I could say that season one is great, so you could watch that, but it doesn't work as a standalone thing, so yeah, I'm not even going to bother recommending that, sadly. But for those who don't know anything about the series, Promised Neverland is about these kids who are raised in what appears to be a great orphanage. But it turns out this orphanage is just a farm run by demons who will kill the kids when they get old enough. Season one was all about them breaking out, discovering what was going on, and hatching their plot to escape. In season one, it picked up right where season one left off, with him exploring the world and surviving. At least for a few episodes. The kids are trying to survive in this world, trying to avoid demons, and eventually making friends with two uh, friendly demons. And this part was really interesting. The two demons, Soju and Mujika, were interesting. And I liked learning about the world from them. We're also wondering if they can be trusted or not. Because up until this point, all the demons seem like bad guys. So there is definitely a lot of suspicion among the kids and the viewers. Like, are these demons good? And I love the sense of journey and adventure during these episodes. Yes, there's danger. But there's so many cool things about the world, too, that it was just fun. A few uh, episodes and the kids found a shelter created by some humans in the past. And this is where the show started to fall apart. It's also where the anime diverted from the manga. Which... Honestly, I'm fine with it diverting. It means there are two different stories that I could enjoy based off the same concept, and that's a good thing. I tend not to read manga often, and when I watch anime, I judge it as a standalone thing. So yeah, it's fine for it to be different. But when it falls apart this badly, and when they go off in their own thing and make a complete mess of it, well, I really wish they would just done a normal adaptation. That would have been good. Instead, the show skipped complete arcs, it was paced so quickly that none of the events had the power they should have, and a lot of it just made no sense at all because they were missing all the context. In episode 4 of the second season, the base was attacked by some kind of soldiers, and while they did work for the farms, there's like so many things we don't know, like how they found the shelter. But the kids got away and ended up being chased by a giant demon at the end of the episode, cue big cliffhanger. Except, the next episode... There is not a resolution to the cliffhanger. It was a time skip instead. Like, what? Which is, that's not how those work at all. Oh, and in episode four, we get the return of Mother Isabella, the one who ran the farm in season one, and was basically the villain of that season. Actually, this part was really cool when I first saw it because I wondered what would happen. Would she help the demons track down the kids? Would she betray the demons for the sake of the kids? Would something happen because she has learned that Ray is her true son? No, to all of that, because she did nothing until the end of the story. And even then, her impact was minimal at best. She was given a chance by the demons to capture the kids. And as far as we can tell, a year passes and she does nothing except get promoted. Because why would you promote someone for doing nothing? And even more so, why would you promote someone who let a bunch of kids escape? That's the last person you should promote. So back to the time skip. It was terrible. Though there's some who would say it wasn't actually a time skip because they wrote the year wrong when the kids were like journaling or whatever. 
but no, that was just them not being uh, caring when they were writing that part or animating it or whatever. Which shows how much care really went into it. They don't care about the artistic details. They don't care about the story. Sadly. Enough tangents. Back to the bad time skip and the time skip being bad. Time skip should be used when there's nothing interesting plot-wise going on. Like an arc is finished, it makes sense not to have another big arc start right away timeline-wise, but it also makes sense for it to narratively for the story. So you do a time skip. But in Promised Everland's case, the arc had not wrapped up, the kids were being pursued by the farms, actively being chased by a giant demon, Isabella just got recruited by the demons to go after them, and there's still a ton of questions about William Minerva and the shelter. And then bam, year passes. Just like that. <laughs> like, that's so jarring. <laughs> I mean, time skips tend to be jarring, but that's fine if they can draw you back in. But it broke the immersion, and it never got it back. Then the next episode, Norman returned. Which, I think that was the point the show really fell apart. Back in season one, Norman was the smartest of the main characters, or really any of the characters. He was taken away, thought to have been killed near the end of season one, which was a big, tragic, sad event for everyone. I thought he had actually survived and would be back since it was kind of implied, but I was excited for his big return because I liked his character so much. But his return was handled in the worst possible way. He and his allies show up to save the rest of the kids, kill a few demons, but they weren't really a threat worthy of Norman story-wise. Plus it was too soon. Only a few episodes had passed with him being gone, so it was like he was never gone to begin with. Plus, at this point, the story just focuses on him and his plan for the most part, which also feels jarring when he wasn't supposed to be alive the episode prior. But yeah, it focuses on him and his plan. Oh, and not before a boring recap episode. So yeah, we see Norman escaping from the lab where he's being experimented on, and Norman came up with a way to eradicate the demons, basically concocting a gas that would cause them to revert to the wild forms and then go wild and kill all the other demons around, making it safe for humans. Except there are so many gaps in this, like we have no idea how he came up with this plan, where he learned that this would happen. It was like can just completely hand waved. We did get a short flashback of how he escaped the research facility, but again, was so rushed it didn't have the impact. We learned basically nothing about how he came up with this plan, how he escaped, other than like he pressed a chest piece and stuff blew up. We also learned basically nothing about all the other characters there, like he saves some other people. They join his team, but they have no character to them. They're just a group of physically strong characters who can fight the demons. That's all there is to them. And the same applies to the kids as well. Emma is the only character that's interesting at all this season. Like, Ray becomes nothing more than a cold, logical foil to Emma. Don and Gilda have very flat personalities, and the other kids are there basically for no other reason than if they weren't there, we would ask what happened to them. And then there's, like, the demon Emma, which people think and she's adorable, which she kind of is, but there's nothing to her other than being a cute character. Emma, the human Emma at least, is kind of interesting at least. Like, she's very idealistic. She doesn't like Norman's plan of wiping out all the demons. And she basically will go along with it anyway, or is willing to for the sake of everyone else, but like tears at her. And that's actually interesting. Though the way it was resolved ended up just falling flat. You have Norman unleash the gas. And this was definitely the most powerful moment of the season. Like, it caused a ton of damage in the city. Fires everywhere. Demons turning on each other. Family eating other family. That in yeah, very chilling. And no one felt all that. Sure, he knew logically what would happen. But it's another thing to see it. And I liked it. The pain. The awe. The terror. That's how you tell a good story. Except it does not work as well because it does not have the good story foundations to make it good other than just the shocking scene it was. It doesn't make any sense why Norman was in the city after he did this. Like, why would he be there? He's vis he is physically pretty weak, so the odds are good a like wild demon could go, could come attack him, even if they didn't mean to. Plus, the one of the demons still want to go after the humans if they saw him. And yeah, that was just dumb. And it felt like they had him there for the big emotional impact, not because it made any logical sense. And then it just was resolved so easily. Mujika has the power to basically give her blood to others and they will no longer need to eat humans to maintain their humanity. Which felt really cheap. It basically feels like a deus ex machina 
to resolve the situation. Because up until this point, it's an interesting dynamic. The demons need to eat humans to maintain their humanity. Obviously, the humans don't want that. And it seems like, in that case, Norman might be right. That the only way for them to survive is to wipe out the demons. But now Mujika just like gives everyone a perfect solution. And I felt lackluster. And I kind of went off script there and I forgot what I was saying. Oh yes, Mujika showed up with Emma, basically gave her blood to everyone, and restored the situation. Which made it feel like he resolved way too easily. Like, Norman does not really face any moral repercussions of this. Yes, Mujika saved the city as a whole, but there's still a lot of demons that died, a lot of demons who lost family even if they themselves lived. And so wouldn't the demons hate Norman because of this, or humanity in general? Sure, some might see it logical and know it might not make sense to go after Norman or blame all humans. But really? Like a town of hundreds, thousands of demons, not some of them would you say that none of them would go after Norman for that? But no, they had to rush into the final arc, which is the kids going back to the farms, saving to everyone, and escaping to the human world. Which actually, that part was kind of cool. The hot air Berlin's they had as decoys. They tricked the demons and then executed their plan. Which was neat, though the plan itself had a lot of holes and things that didn't make sense. But it was still fun. And I take what fun I can get because, well, not every show has to be amazing to be fun. Though it is a shame when a show looks like it'll be amazing and is okay in its best moments only. But here, there really wasn't any tension. A couple twists that were void of power. I didn't care about the characters. The events were basic. The buying games between the multiple sides were non-existent. And the villain was void of any motivations or villainous flair. I guess he kind of got some in the flashback in the final episode, but that was too basic and nonsensical to count. But then the worst part of the show. The final four minutes. They did a slideshow to adapt the last 20 chapters of the manga. Like, the whole season felt kind of rushed. But they just, like, put this there. Rush at a speed I did not think it was possible to give us a conclusion. But it did not work at all. So many big events happened completely off screen, but shown just a tiny, tiny bit of. You literally have the overthrowing of the demon government led by Emma in a format long slideshow. With the song Isabella's Lullaby playing, which doesn't fit at all. And then there's no explanation for the human world side of the story. Like when they got there, it's basically modern day New York. But if a thousand years passed, then that means the portal was set up a thousand years ago, likely also in the same location. And a thousand years ago, why would it be set up in New York? Wouldn't it be like in Britain or something? Or maybe it's connected to the Native American culture. That could be interesting, I think. But that also raises other questions, like what sort of communication is going on between the human world and the demon world? Who in the human world is communicating? Who is doing that? Obviously, the humans in the demon world had like guns and modern weapons, so there has to be some sort of transfer of technologies, wouldn't it? But no, we just like saw the kids living a normal life, kind of. Do you remember the anime back in 2015, Charlotte? It was ambitious, to say the least. Kind of a mess, kind of rushed, but I still kind of liked it. Until the end where they crammed an entire season's worth of content in the final episode, leaving it on one of the worst endings I've ever seen, and at the time I said it was the worst anime I'd ever seen because of that. Here in Heroes Promise Neverland, they crammed an entire season of, of content into a four-minute slideshow, which is like five times worse, and at least Charlotte was animated. Yeah, that's how bad it was. So, does that mean The Promised Neverland is the worst anime ever? Well, there is King's Game in big order. But at least those did not start off good. Maybe they start off okay and then they just went downhill. But Promised Neverland started off amazing. So, does that amazing start make up for the terrible ending? Overall, no. But does it save it from being the worst anime ever? Maybe, I guess. I did like enough parts, but I, I don't think I'll call Promised Neverland the worst anime ever. Or season two ever, though, that's for sure. It, it is terrible, though. I can't even recommend season one, because that's only an introduction, which just makes no sense if you don't watch the rest. So, yeah, you could read the manga, I guess. I mean, the manga is mostly well-respected. Some issues with the end, apparently. 
but I don't even want to recommend that. Because it feels like they made this anime to promote the manga, so I, do I want to let them win by promoting the manga myself? No. If you're going to watch it or read it, just go pirate it. I don't think it deserves your money after what they did here. So yeah, that's my review. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed it more than the series. And I will see you all next time with some other video. Yeah, this one's even longer than my first take. Oh well. <laughs>